Hey, Al Scott Horton here for WallStreetWindow.com. Mike Swanson is a successful former hedge fund manager whose site is unique on the web. Subscribers are allowed a window into Mike's very real main account and receive announcements and explanations for all his market moves. The Federal Reserve has been inflating the money supply to finance the bank bailouts and terror war overseas. So Mike's betting on commodities, mining stocks, European markets, and other hedges against our depreciating dollar. Play along on paper or with real money and then be your own judge of Mike's investment strategies. See what happens at WallStreetWindow.com. All right, welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. The website is scotthorton.org. You can find all my interview archives there. More than 2,800 of them now going back to 2003. And you can also follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at slash Scott Horton Show. Our next guest is Con Hallinan. He writes at Foreign Policy in Focus. That's F-P-I-F dot org. And the latest is Syria and the Monarchs, a perfect storm. Welcome back to the show, Con. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you, Scott? I'm doing real good. Appreciate you joining us today. I sure like reading your articles because uh, you know what you're talking about. So um, thanks for joining us. Uh, I hope you can uh, say out loud all the great stuff that you wrote in here about what exactly is America's role in the at least so-called civil war there in Syria as of, say, the end of June 2013. Well, we're doing a, a whole number of things, and and a lot of some of it's been under the radar, and some of it has been um sort of in the open very early on when the um uh civil war broke out uh in Syria uh, the US made it clear that their position was that the Assad government had to go and that that was sort of the bottom line for negotiations or political resolution or uh uh or anything like that and then they very quickly um, sent uh, significant numbers of CIA agents and special forces into Jordan, where they began training um, uh, these insurgents, the Syrian insurgents. Um, and they also uh, encouraged uh, the Gulf monarchies, particularly Qatar and um, Saudi Arabia, to begin supplying arms to to the rebels. And they did that, one, by encouraging them to do that, and then two, negotiating with the Turks so that a, a lot of the, 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 the arms now come uh, in through the Jordanian border in the south, and large numbers, uh, most of them come in um, through the Turkish borders in the north. So we've sort of been in on, on the ground, uh, you know, it, it, right from the beginning we've been involved in this, even though Publicly, of course, what we've said is we want a political resolution, and also that we um, uh, that uh, that we're uh, that we're not going to uh, up until a couple of, uh, up to a week ago that we were not going to be directly involved in supplying arms uh, and ammunition to the rebels. We are now. Right, and now, you know, I I always wondered about. What was even really the point about just having the Saudis and the Qataris do it? Because it wasn't very plausible deniability for anybody who was interested in it. Obviously, the whole dang thing was a CIA op, or at least we're involved enough uh, with the Saudis. We certainly weren't telling them to please don't or anything like that. And as you're saying, we've been coordinating them and, and trying to create you know American-owned rebel groups in Turkey and Jordan this whole time, I guess successfully creating some groups in Turkey and Jordan this whole time, but... So if they've been that involved all along, what is the point of just having the Qataris buy the guns for us and we'll pay them back or whatever? You know what I mean? Well, actually, the Qataris are, are buying them on their own. They're, um, you know, they're immensely wealthy. They're, they're uh, per capita wise, they're, they're the wealthiest country uh, in the world. Uh, they have a very small population, a large amount of oil. Um, they have already... Uh, pumped in about three billion dollars actually i don't think the americans could afford to do that right now and so if the qataris are gonna uh, uh qatar is gonna do it and the saudis are gonna do it um that's icing on on the cake for us i think one thing it, it should be people need to kind of dial back their history on this um this U.S. involvement here didn't begin with the outbreak of the Civil War two years ago uh, in, 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 in Syria. Back in 2005, the uh, Bush administration, uh, after it had uh, invaded Iraq, 
sort of gave gave a list of of targets, the next on the list, um, and the and the two major targets for the next on the list were Iran and and Syria, the Assad government and Syria, and also uh, by implication uh, Hezbollah in uh, in in Lebanon, southern Lebanon, and then in 2005 the. Uh, uh, King Abdullah of Jordan um, gave a speech which called for the formation of an uh, anti-Shiite alliance uh, to deal with what the, he called the the threat of the Shiite crescent, and that Shiite crescent would be Hezbollah, Syria, Iraq, um, and uh, Iran. And so, in in a sense, these uh, Syria has been sort of in our gun sights. Um, for a long time, and I think in part that that is in part why it is that the uh, Assad dictatorship reacted as violently as they did in the initial stages um, of what were peaceful demonstrations and, and peaceful demonstrations by um, mostly teenagers. Uh, and the uh, the this civil war started because of the the brutality of the Assad regime, but it is no longer that. I mean, now it's it's a it's a proxy war, and you know you've got uh, Turkey and the United States and and Britain and France and and the 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 Gulf Cooperation Council, which is the uh, the Gulf monarchies, uh, on one side, and and uh, Iraq to a certain sense, the Maliki government in Iraq, Iran, um, Russia. Kind of distantly, China um, and Hezbollah uh, on the other side. So, you know, the the issues now are are um, have morphed into something which are very very different, and it's much more dangerous. I mean, it's it's destabilizing countries all over the Middle East. This is the single most destabilizing event since the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Right. Well, and in so many ways, as you're saying, is a direct consequence. Of that invasion. But yeah. Now, I think we talked about, uh, last time you were on the show and we talked about Afghanistan, we talked about how they're not leaving any weapons behind in the hands of the Afghan army because they know that the Afghan army, such as it is, you know, when you can stop laughing, will be dead the day they leave and that those weapons would then end up in the hands of the Taliban or whoever else and they can't have that. So they're basically leaving them without even so much as rocket, uh, you know, shoulder fired rocket launchers or any kind of thing. And it seems like the policy in Syria for the last couple of years, two and a half years now almost, has been, yeah, give them AKs and, and, you know, maybe some explosives or something like that, but not enough to actually win, just enough to hurt, right? Well, that's certainly, that, it does look like that, Scott. It, although there was a very interesting piece last week in the Los Angeles Times uh, that, um, that basically said that the Obama administration has been training um, the uh, insurgents in Jordan in in the use of um, air to ground uh, missiles, what they call these man pads, these uh, shoulder fired uh, anti aircraft uh, weapons, and and also anti tank weapons. Now, uh, shoulder fired um, uh, anti aircraft weapons and anti armor weapons, anti tank weapons, are, are sort of the two things that the Obama administration said very early on. We're not going to supply these kinds of things because we don't know where they're going to go. We don't know where they're going to end up, and they could end up, you know, knocking down commercial airplanes or being used against Israel or our allies, other allies in the in the Middle East. But apparently, that that's not true. I mean, apparently we have been training uh, people in the use of these. They haven't shown up a lot, and and I, I don't know exactly what that means. I assume um, what it means is that even the Qataris and the um, Saudis are having difficulties obtaining um, uh, these uh, kind of you know shoulder fired anti aircraft weapons. Um, but I don't have any doubts that in the long run. They probably will show up. And well, now what about the policy? I mean, are they trying to arm them? Shoulder fired weapons or not? Tanks or not? I mean, are they, are they actually trying to? The Obama team, I mean, are they really working to see Damascus fall and these kooks take it over? I mean, they are the kooks now, the Al Nusra and, and Associated Brigades here, or are they really just trying to bog Assad down for the indefinite future kind of a thing? Well, you know, I think, Scott, they're doing both. That is, <clears throat> I don't think the administration is entirely of one mind on this. Uh, they, 
you're right. You're absolutely right. That is, they have not supplied the rebels with the kind of equipment that they need to um, to really take on the um, uh, the Syrian army. On the other hand, I think one of the reasons why they've done that is because they are very nervous um, about who is who who it is they're going to be supplying in Syria and the, right now the the most effective frontline troops are the uh, are the Nusra front which is very closely associated with al qaeda and particularly al qaeda in in Iraq so you you, know, you have the, the administration on one hand they want to get rid of Assad on the other hand the only people who are really going to get rid of Assad um, are people who not only don't like the United States, but also don't like the U.S. allies. That is, they tend to also be um, uh, very opposed to the uh, Saudi Arabian regime. Um, if you recall, bin Laden got his start uh, setting off bombs in Saudi Arabia. And and he started off denouncing the Saudis because um, the Saudis allowed Americans um, close to the holy sites uh, in in uh, in Saudi Arabia. So I mean it, it's it's an absolute mess. I mean we have you know we have set loose in the Shakespearean fashion. We have cried havoc and and uh, and set loose the dogs of war. And the dogs of war in the Middle East are well they're not only really dangerous but they're also all over the place and and we don't control them and i think the the administration is in a in a position of where it wants to overthrow assad um and it initially thought that all they had to do was push a little bit and assad would fall that's what the turks thought as well well it hasn't turned out that way and now they're kind of stuck and they won't sort of bite the bullet. And, you know, the bullet is um, that you, you essentially say, look, if you want a peaceful diplomatic resolution, you can't tell people what the outcome is in advance. I mean, you can't say, yeah, we want a diplomatic solution. Assad has to resign. That's not negotiations. Um, what you have to say is we need to sit, get all the parties to sit down and talk about get a ceasefire. Stop the flow of arms from everybody, um, from Qatar, Saudi Arabia, United States, Turkey, Russia, Iran, etc. Get a ceasefire. And then we've got presidential elections coming up in 2014. Let's see if we can't work some sort of thing around the presidential elections in 2014. If Assad doesn't have any support in the country, let him run for president. Guarantee that there will be uh, access for an opposition, and we'll have a political resolution. Well, and that's but they're the problem not right making there. that decision. That's their problem is they know if there is an election that he will win. If the opposition I'm, yeah, I think, is, you know, that's what they're that's what they're discovering. I mean, they're discovering two things. Number one, Assad always had more support than they projected that he had, and then two, Syria. Syria is a secular country. And has been a secular country for a long time. So these insurgent groups, not all of them, but the, the key insurgent groups, um, they, the, the, the secular Syrians are horrified uh, by who these people are. It doesn't mean they support Assad. It means that they would, caught between the devil and deep blue sea, um, they would rather go with what they have than than what they fear um, from these, um, you know, Islamic extremist groups uh, in the future. If it came to an election, you might find that a lot of those people would say, well, okay, we want the end of the civil war, we'll support Assad, but I won't necessarily vote for him, I'll vote for another candidate. But the only way you can do that is by getting a ceasefire and stopping this idea that you're going to um, kind of shoot your way uh, into a into a diplomatic resolution. It's not going to do it. But I, I, you know, Scott, I I I'm a curable optimist, but I got to tell you, I'm pretty pessimistic on the way this is going to end up. I mean, I I see this going on for a long time, and I I don't see the United States really being serious about a diplomatic resolution and. 
Uh, and I, I just think it's gonna, I think it's gonna drag on, maybe for years. Well, you know, here's the thing. Um, it's sort of kind of all on purpose, right? I mean, I just talked with Fred Bronfman, and we we're trying to tally up the body count of the American Empire in the last forty or fifty years, or something like that. It's a big one. Yeah, it, it, it is a big one, but. Um, you know, a big part of what happened in Iraq, as he mentioned, was that Douglas Fife and uh, Paul Bremer decided that they would disband the Iraqi army and right. police force and let them eat sand. Right. <laughs> and, and that the occupy Now, look, it's easy, always very extremely easy to consider Fife just really bad at being a person and, and anything that he's ever done is always horrible. But, you know, I don't think you've got to be that kooky to think that this is just what the Yanan plan, if that's how you pronounce it, from uh, back in the early 1980s, that the right-wing nationalist Likud party and worse in Israel would like to see all of the Middle East broken up into warring tribes instead yeah. of nation states that they would ever have to worry about again. Sure. And so what's going on here is Doug Fight doing their dirty work in Iraq. And, you know, you're right that uh, obviously Iraq has fallen into pro-Iranian hands and, and, and Shiite hands and whatever. So much the better for long-term, uh, low-level, intersectarian conflict and butchery murder. And everyone will be leaving Israel alone in the meantime. And I guess leaving the kings of Saudi Arabia alone so that Houston can have their way too. Well, I mean, I, you know, that's a very... That's an absolutely valid way of looking at it, Scott, because um, the, the, certainly the Israelis have always taken the, the point of view that uh, ruling you can rule from – either you rule with dictators who are close to you, like, like uh, Mubarak in, in Egypt, um, or chaos. And if you have chaos, then you don't have any organized um, resistance to, to Israel. And, I mean, perfect example. Palestinians have dropped off the, you know, dropped off the front pages. Um, uh, with the Syrian civil war going on, um, the situation in Iran, nobody's talking about the Palestinians. And the, the Netanyahu government continues to build more settlements, continues to deepen its uh, grip on the uh, on the West Bank. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, at this point, Lieberman was talking about that they have to go back into Gaza. And uh, the right. pretty open talk about the fact that Israel would like a rematch with Hezbollah um, in southern Lebanon at some some point in the next year or so. So I, I mean, I do think you're right. I think that uh, if you have the kind of chaos that is likely to flow from a continuation of the Syrian civil war, um, I, I do think that that what that does is that it creates uh, a very fertile ground um, for being able to manipulate the politics of the region. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, you know, ruling from chaos is a long, long time. Uh, long, matter of fact, it's an old British tactic. Right. Well, and you know, if your goal is chaos and you don't have to be very good at it either, you, just, you know, if your goal is screwing up. So I don't think that you know, when they wrote the road to Damascus runs through Baghdad and all that in the clean break strategy, they didn't think they were going to be handing over two thirds of Iraqistan to the Shiites in, in alliance with Iran. You know, they thought, hell, I mean, if, if they believed any of their own nonsense, they thought that uh, a Shiite democracy in Iraq was going to put all this pressure on Iran where we wouldn't even have to regime change them because the people would love us so much and want to be like Iraq now and whatever. I think Wolfowitz actually really believes some of that nonsense anyway, but it doesn't matter how bad they screwed up and that Chalabi was an Iranian spy all along and whatever, whatever, because, uh, oh, well, so just we'll just have more war then. Well, I mean, I think it's true. You know, you 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 uh, it, it, we don't pay a cost um, uh, or, or we pay a small cost. I mean, in a sense, I guess you could look at 9-11 and say, well, that's a cost. Um, and we pay a cost in places in, in, in the dead and wounded in Iraq and, and in Afghanistan. Um, but, you know, it's not, it, it, it's not a massive, um, uh, it's not a massive bill, although financially it's a massive bill. And now, you know, the Obama administration has really gotten this, thing of, you know, no boots on the ground, we can carry out a war by killing at a distance, uh, the drone wars. And uh, and it's a, it's a cheap way 
to to run war. Um, it certainly produces chaos. Um, it, it it makes things worse. Uh, it certainly has made things worse in uh, in Afghanistan. I mean, one of the effects of the drone war. Uh, people think of the drone war only in Pakistan. In fact, it's going on in Afghanistan as well. One of the effects of, of, the, of the drone war is that we've knocked off a, a significant uh, section of the Afghan, uh, top Afghan Taliban leadership. And so now what you have is this fragmented organization that, you know, kind of whose politics vary from valley to valley. I'm not quite certain who they're going to sit down and negotiate with uh, in, in the end. And but this is you know this is a, a problem we created. Uh, we basically knocked off the adults, um, and what you you've got is a bunch of young teenagers in charge of the Taliban. Mm-hmm. And, and and how are you going how are you going to talk with those people? No. So you know it's just anyhow it, it, it you know when you when you start adding all the things up, Scott, it can be look pretty discouraging. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> not much is for sure. But we we trudge on. Uh, now, so back to the Arab world here for a minute. Um, in the chat room, someone's asking about uh, what Wesley Clark talked about, which this was, you know, Rumsfeld and Richard Pearl and, and Paul Wolfowitz and them and their plan and, and the, what, seven regime changes, right? And it included uh, Libya and, of course, Ariel Sharon and John Bolton right after the Iraq invasion said Libya and Syria and Iran have to be next on the list. And Wesley right. Clark... Wesley Clark basically came out back in what oh seven and said, well, they also even were talking about regime change in Somalia uh, way back in late oh one, early oh two, um, and then there were a couple of more on the list. So I guess the question then is, so the Yanan plan makes perfect sense if you're a right wing Israeli nationalist uh, and you just want to you know break the whole region up into warring nation states, but. What exactly, or I don't know, is there even a consensus view in in D.C. or was there about what the hell they were trying to accomplish? Were they trying to turn all of North Africa into chaos stand as well? I mean, it seems like having Hosni Mubarak run Egypt is preferable to having, from the Empire's point of view, is preferable to having chaos or even the Muslim Brotherhood there, right? Well, you know, I, I think that when you the question you ask, you know, is there one point of view? In D.C. and, and I, I think that there probably isn't one point of view uh, in D.C. and I think that some of it is illusion. Um, you know, that is, oh yeah, we're going to go in and we're going to create these, uh, you know, kind of liberal democracies, and and everybody will be saying, you know, will be throwing flowers at our feet um, because you know we bought about this wonderful change. I mean, there there are people who actually believe that. Um, there are the liberal interventionists, you know, who think you know, and you get you get a crisis, and and it's a crisis in an area which is a, important to American interest. Then you you know you intervene, um, and and then you you get people who who are basically arguing, look, just keep the pot boiling. I mean, that's that's the key. Keep the pot boiling. Uh, and as long as the pot boils, then um, essentially we can afford to move uh, where we where we want, how we want, et cetera. And, and nobody's really there's real no no real serious opposition to this. Certainly, Syria was a country that you know did not represent uh, the politics of the United States or Israel uh, in in the Middle East, and so knocking off the Assad regime um, was a big plus. Same thing with Iran. As to whether or not all of this was thought out, I think some people thought it all out, um, and other people. This is the way they they look at the world. They they figure that the Americans are the number you know we're the number one power in the world, and that we can still use a force projection, as the term goes. Um, we can still use force projection to to get our way uh, in the world, and 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 that's a that's an attitude, which is really a deep set. Um, attitude and and I think it's one that obviously has to change, but when it changes and how it changes, that's not clear to me at this point. Well, you know, Ron Paul keeps coming up uh, today. He always said it won't change because you listen to me. It'll change because we're going to run out of money, and when your dollars won't even afford to get the guys home on Delta from Afghanistan, that's when the empire is going to fall apart. Basically, you know. <laughs> 
Well, there was an interesting piece in the uh, Financial Times uh, from one of their key editors, and, and basically what he was saying is the United States has to give up on this idea that it has an empire in the Middle East. It doesn't. And it, and it needs to get out. Now, of course, that's also predicated on the basis of fracking. In other words, the United States is going to be energy independent because of fracking. Yeah, but what are you going to do it, about uh, APAC? <laughs> I, well, the other side of it is, is you know, there is no more destructive way, except maybe the oil sands, um, to uh, extract energy, um, uh, except fracking. I mean, fracking is just, you know, people have no idea that one of the big things that fracking does is it pours methane into the atmosphere. You think CO2 is bad. Methane is a hundred times more efficient as a global warming device. I mean, and we're pouring, already pouring tons and tons and tons of methane uh, into the atmosphere. So if we're going to be in, in, in energy independent, but we're also going to be underwater. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Colin. we got to go, dude. I'm already okay. over time. i got to get Chase Madara on here to talk about Bradley Manning. but Absolutely. Uh, I really appreciate your time on the show. You're really great at this stuff. And Anytime, I'll talk to you Scott. Soon. It's fun to talk to you. Yep, right on. All right, All everybody, right. that is Con Hallinan. He is at uh, Foreign Policy in Focus. That's FPIF.org. FPIF.org. The latest is Syria and the Monarchs, A Perfect Storm. It is a great rundown. Well, as you just heard, a great rundown of America's position in the uh, Syria rebellion. And obviously there are a lot of questions left unasked and unanswered there. But we got to go. We'll be right back with uh, Chase Madar on Bradley Manning right after this. Admit it. Our public debate has been reduced to reading each other's bumper stickers. Scott Horton here for LibertyStickers.com. I made up most of them and most of those when I was mad as hell about something. So if you hate war, empire, central banking, cops, Republicans, Democrats, gun grabbers, and status of all stripes, go to LibertyStickers.com and there's a good chance you'll find just what you need for the back of your truck. Own a bookstore? Sell guns at the show? Get the wholesalers deal. Buy any hundred stickers and they drop down in price to a dollar apiece. You can spread the contempt and make a little money too. That's LibertyStickers.com. Everyone else's stickers suck. Hey y'all, Scott Horton here for the Future of Freedom, the journal of the Future of Freedom Foundation. Every month, Plumline Individualist Editor Sheldon Richmond brings you important news and opinions on policy by heroic FFF President Jacob Hornberger, hard-hitting journalist columnist James Bovard, and others from the best of the libertarian movement. The Future of Freedom tackles the most important issues facing our country, from the bankrupt and insane welfare and regulatory states, to foreign wars and empire, the dismal state of our economy, and ongoing assaults on civil liberties. This society needs peace and freedom for prosperity to prevail. Subscribe to the Future of Freedom in print for just $25 a year, or online for $15 a year at fff.org slash subscribe. And hurry up. Because this summer they'll be running my articles about the wars in Libya, Syria, and Somalia in the future of freedom, too. That's fff.org slash subscribe for the future of freedom. And tell them Scott sent you. Oh, man, I'm late. Sure hope I can make my flight. Stand there. Me? I am standing here. Come here. Okay. Hands up. Turn around. Oh, easy. Into the scanner. Ooh, what's this in your pants? Hey, slow down. It's just my... Hold it right there. Your wallet has tripped the metal detector. What's this? The bill of rights? That's right. It's just a harmless stainless steel business card-sized copy of the bill of rights from securityedition.com. There for exposing the TSA as a bunch of liberty-destroying goons who've never protected anyone from anything. Sir, now give me back my wallet and get out of my way. Got a plane to catch. Have a nice day. Play a leading role in the security theater with the Bill of Rights Security Edition from SecurityEdition.com. It's the size of a business card, so it fits right in your wallet, and it's guaranteed to trip the metal detectors wherever the police state goes. That's SecurityEdition.com. And don't forget their great Fourth Amendment socks. Hey, guys, I got his laptop.
Over at APAC, the leaders of the Israel lobby in Washington, D.C., they're constantly proclaiming unrivaled influence on Capitol Hill, and they should be proud. The NRA and AARP's efforts make them look like puppy dogs in comparison to the campaigns of intimidation regularly run by the neoconservatives and Israel firsters against their political enemies. But the Israel lobby does not remain unopposed. At the Council for the National Interest, they put America first, insisting on an end to the empire's unjustified support for Israel's aggression against its neighbors. And those whose land it occupies, and pushing back against the lobby's determined campaign in favor of U.S. attacks against Israel's enemies. CNI also does groundbreaking work on the trouble with evangelical Christian Zionism and neocon-engineered Islamophobia and drumming up support for this costly and counterproductive policy. Please help support the efforts of the Council for the National Interest to create a peaceful, pro-American foreign policy. Just go to councilforthenationalinterest.org and click Donate under About Us at the top of the page. And thanks. Hey, I'll Scott Horton here to tell you about this great new project, Listen and Think Audio at listenandthink.com. They've got two new audio books read by the deepest voice in libertarianism, the great historian Jeff Riggenbach. Our Last Hope, Rediscovering the Lost Path to Liberty by Michael Meharry of the Tenth Amendment Center is available now. And Beyond Democracy, co-authored by Frank Karsten of the Mises Institute Netherlands and journalist Carl Beckman will be released this month. And they're only just getting started. So check out listenandthink.com. You may be able to get your first audio book absolutely free. That's Listen and Think Audio at listenandthink.com.